the, the woman, he's like, hi, and she says, hi, and then she says, so why should I be spending my time with you? You'll have to sell yourself on me. And he's like, oh, please, don't even bother trying to play hard to get. You're 38 years old. Like, what's with the holy nonsense, right? So. Most women I interact with seem to want kindness, yeah. Is it creepy to ask her out when she is at work? Didn't they invite barbarians in? Um, no, not exactly. It, 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 tax policy and debt policy. So very, very briefly, what happened towards the end of Rome was taxes increased but they, could, they only had the manpower to collect taxes in the cities. So all the young men moved out of the cities and got works on farms in the country. And so you couldn't really collect taxes. And you also couldn't conscript. Because it's one thing to conscript in a city. It's another thing to conscript men who were scattered throughout the countryside where the guy can go missing and nobody will ever find him, the, the conscriptor guy. So what happened was, as their manpower went down, they had to hire mercenaries, right? And so because they had to hire mercenaries, they had to raise taxes on the cities, which drove more young men out of the cities. And then they had to pay more because they could draft fewer men. So their costs of enforcing the empire's boundaries were going up and their tax base was shrinking. And then eventually the barbarians weren't getting paid and they came and sacked Rome because they weren't getting paid. So they didn't invite them in. It was just... We, we, we never escape the cycle of gruesome disaster currently playing out in the West, of course. We never escape this cycle as long as we have this day. The beauty of having children is that everything else pretty much falls away. Yeah. Love of pets, collections of stuff, even politics just seem unimportant when your two-year-old is counting to 20 in Spanish, English, and Chinese. Good for you. Yeah, this morning I was going to do, I bought... I bought my notes, right? I was going to do uh, some Q&As. My daughter got up a little early, and so she came down and she said, uh, would you like to sit with the ducks? Which is where we get towels, and we sit with the ducks, and we chat and pet the ducks. And, of course, I love doing philosophy, but it's like, yes, I would absolutely love to come and sit with the ducks. It just simplifies your life a whole lot, right? All right. Let's get to your, let's get to your question about people pleasing. I wish there was a search function on the chat, but there is not. But that's because it's not my code. All right, did I write this down? Did I? Yes, I did. Oh, glorious, magnificent. All right. This is for Pauline. This is for Rosanna, sweet girl of mine. Steph, can you please, 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 please me touch on how to break the people-pleasing cycle. Your insight is powerful. Okay, I appreciate that. So the people-pleasing cycle. So uh, unfortunately, it's in the language. The problem with that is in the language. You're not people-pleasing. It's fear-based manipulation. It's not people-pleasing. You're not trying to please people, right? Like, if there's a lion I think is going to charge at me and I throw a piece of meat to one side, am I lion-pleasing? Nope. I'm hoping the lion will be appeased by the meat and not attack me. So it's not people-pleasing. I mean... Who wouldn't want to please the people they love in their life? I mean, I'm trying to please you, the audience. I'm trying to please philosophy. I'm, you know, hopefully going to enjoy things myself as well. But, you know, if you've got people in your life you care about, you want to please them. Of course you do. I mean, I want to please you by going higher and higher, apparently. <laughs> apparently. <laughs> so it's not people pleasing. It's fear-based manipulation. So you fear attack. And so you appease. It's the appeasement to preempt attack. It's people appeasing. Yes, but the important thing is it's a way to... It's not people-pleasing. It's fear-based manipulation 
And the problem with fear-based manipulation is it doesn't get the bad people out of your life. It's a tactic to get predators off your back. Well, not really, though. I mean, it's very momentary, right? So let's say I have to walk in the Serengeti every day for some reason, and I keep bringing meat with me so that I can uh, appease the lions that might want to eat me. And so every time a lion shows up, I throw some meat. Oh, look, I've appeased the lions. What's the secondary effect? Lions seek me out. It doesn't get them off your back. It keeps them in your orbit. Because if you appease, bow down for, and provide resources to people because they threaten you, they will come back and continue to threaten you because they get resources. Right? If you give the bully money every day, the bully doesn't stop bullying you. So it is a very short-term strategy to deal with aggressive people, which guarantees that more and more aggressive people are going to be in your life or stay in your life. Thank you, David. Oh, it doesn't work. I certainly, now, it's a perfectly acceptable strategy as, ch as children. It's a perfectly acceptable strategy as children. Because you can't get, if you have abusive parents, you can't get the predators out of your life. But you can't. You can't get the predators out of your life. Because they're your parents and your, your teachers or the kids you're locked up with at school. Closest thing to prison most people ever experience. So it's a perfectly valid strategy when you're a kid because you can't get the predators out of your life. The problem is when you continue in it as an adult, then you then are voluntarily choosing to reward predation. Right? You're voluntarily choosing to reward predation. And that means the predators will stick around. You are the oasis to which they return to get their drink. Yeah, boarding school is prison. Yeah, fishing very much so. So you're not pleasing people. As, as an adult, you are managing your own anxiety regarding predation by appeasing people and buying them off. So how do we train ourselves out of that behavior? You know the answer to that. You know the answer to that. Come on, how do you how do you stop doing this? Let's go back to the African analogy. How do you stop getting half ambushed and stalked and preyed upon by lions? Do you keep throwing the meat? Nope. That's just going to get more and more lion. Hey, free meat! All you have to do is growl. I stop doing it? No, that's not training yourself out of it. Deal with the anxiety? Eh, that's tautology. How do you deal? How do you stop the anxiety? You deal with it. What does that mean? Choose to not continue enabling evil people. That's not enough. Because if the lions are all gathered around because you keep throwing the meat, you've got 10 lions around you like, I'm not throwing you any more meat. Well, then what happens? Your ass is grass. You now, your next view is your eyeball staring out the ass of a lion as he poops you on the Weltschoon. Yeah, you stop walking the paths with lions. You stop walking the paths with lions. You stop engaging with people who frighten you. I mean, your fear is there for a reason. Staff, uh, you know, I got to tell you, man, every time I stick my hand in that fire, I get burned. How do I, how do I deal with that? How do I, how do I deal with the pain? How do I deal with the horror and, and the burn and the smell? How, how do you, how do you shoot the lion who attacks you? Well, um, you still have nine other lions, <laughs> right? So that's not great. 
But uh, obviously you're not talking about violence in your personal life, but uh, no, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. I, I will, I as a person who's not naturally aggressive, will take on 10 aggressive people and win. It's like, no, you won't. No, you won't. Because you have a conscience, which means there's a limit to how much your aggression is going to escalate, and you're dealing with people who don't have a conscience and who are willing to do whatever it takes. And the people who are willing to do whatever it takes will generally win against the people who have a conscience limiter. I do it with nice people too, though, Steph. So? What are you talking about? I, I'm terrified of lions. I feed them. I also feed kittens. It's like, so? I don't know what, I don't know what that means. I'm not saying don't feed kittens. I'm saying don't be around where the lions are. But the problem is that even if you manage to get all of these people out of your life, they can still use the power of the state to extract reasons for you from you via taxation. Well, aren't you a anvil around my balls? Ah, oh, dear, oh dear, oh dear, my friend. What an absolutely craptastic response. You know, I'm very vulnerable to abusers in my life. But taxation! <laughs> so there's no escape, you see. They'll just, there's no, don't try, you can't win. Here's a solution that could really help people, but there is law and taxation, so... Mm. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Okay, you just keep focusing on the taxation and we'll just be happy in our marriages and have great friendships and relationships and you just keep getting depressed by taxation. <laughs> okay. Uh, hi, Steph. I have cut out all abusive people in my life, but like you said in a recent call in removing abusive habits is another thing. For example, treating people like abusers. What are your biggest pieces of advice removes abusive habits? I don't know what you mean. Treating people like abusers? Cut out all abusive people in my life. Yeah, that sounds like a call then. I, I, I don't know what you mean. Yeah, I, I don't know what you mean. How do you stop treating people as abusers when they're not abusers? First of all, how do you know that they're not abusers? Second of all, if you've got the people out of your life who are abusive, but you haven't morally condemned them in your heart, the behavior is just going to replicate. Right? Mor moral condemnation is your defense line against the intrusive thoughts, right? What is your best advice to stop treating virtuous people like abusers? Well, it means that the abusers are still running your mind, which means you haven't drawn that fiery moral moat between you and the abusers. Good morning and welcome. No, I, I know what he's talking about. He's talking about like the people who, when I'm talking with them in call-in shows, they treat me with outrageous levels of manipulation and deference because they're treating me as they would treat their abusive parents, right? Or whoever else might have been abusive in their life. So how do you stop doing that? Well, it's one thing to get the people out of your physical life. It's another thing to get them out of your head. And the way that you get them out of your head is you unreservedly condemn them as evil. Evil, monstrous, you're a hero for surviving. They are unredeemable, unrecoverable, committed to evil, committed to destruction, committed to harm, and so on, right? You draw that fiery moral moat between you and the bad guys. No hesitation, no issues, no, well, but they had bad childhoods. Like I was reading the other day about the number of German women who were brutally gang raped by the Russian soldiers. And again, it's World War II, there's a lot of propaganda, but um, my mother was uh, eight, seven or eight years old at the end of World War II, and they said that the um, soldiers were raping the women from eight to 80. 10,000 of them were killed, hundreds of thousands of them were raped multiple times, and uh, it was just uh, brutal, right? And I assume it was somewhat payback for what the German soldiers did in Russia in the uh, Operation Barbarossa. Right? The, it was a 42 invasion of Russia. And, of course, that was my mother's childhood. And was she 
you know, assaulted in this kind of way by soldiers, I would not doubt it at all. I don't have proof. I would, I would not doubt it at all. She did talk about having to flirt with a Russian gun, a Russian tank commander, so he wouldn't destroy the village. And I don't know what she means by flirt, but who knows, right? But uh, there are no origin stories that excuse evil doing. Otherwise, we can't have moral standards. Yeah, the taxation argument. Yeah, yeah, there's taxation. I get all of that. It's still pretty much the best time to be alive. We're having this conversation, aren't we? And to me, the taxation argument is like, well, I mean, what's the point of working out? It's like going to make you immortal. You're going to die anyway. Quality of life is important and self-respect is important and your body keeps you alive. How about you repay it with some movement and exercise and decent food? All right, so we're almost at our hour. If you want to get in, if you're not a donor and you want to get in any other questions or comments, I'm certainly happy to hear them, but we're going to switch to donor only in a couple of minutes and we can spice it up as much as you like. I will do my best to answer this, uh, your, your questions, and we will get to that in a second, but I'm certainly happy to hear your comments now. Don't forget your donations at freedomain.com slash donate. It's funny, Trump talks about the US government getting involved in Bitcoin and Bitcoin crashes. <laughs> Probably coincidental. All right. He says, uh, paying taxes is still a form of appeasement. I, it's appeasement when you don't have to, but you go to jail if you don't pay taxes. So it's a, right? So it's not appeasement. Somebody says, uh, oh, I had a friend who was a German female teenager at the end of World War II. I didn't get to say goodbye to her when she passed, but my God, what an amazing person. You can easily turn suffering into virtue. Ability to walk to the washroom is something to be welcomed. Maybe that is an answer to why exercise. I mean, honestly, you exercise out of deep gratitude to the amazing machinery that keeps you alive. I mean, you tell me anything that works for 80 or 90 years without you having to open it up and repair. It's incredible. It's incredible. And the body is, a, is the foundation on, uh, it's the foundation on which all your thoughts rest, is the functionality of the body. And if you take the body for granted, then it, it will get back at you. And it's a lack of gratitude. I'm fundamentally incredibly grateful for my body for keeping me alive and being functional and being healthy and all of that. So I, uh, I, uh, when I receive a gift, I like to reciprocate. And receiving the gift of life from my body makes me want to reciprocate uh, because I'm not selfish that way. I may be selfish in other ways, but I'm not selfish that way. <laughs> All right. Good. Okay. So uh, we will go to supporters in a minute and uh, then we'll, the, the next part will just be for donors only. Uh, you're not donor only yet in 50 seconds or so, give or take. I'll tell you when it is. And if you have questions, great. Uh, I'll tell you a sentence. This is what I'm going to deal with at some point. Somebody wrote, thanks for answering my question and apologies for upsetting you, but I assure you that that was not my intention. My question was based on genuine curiosity and I don't find your answer particularly satisfying because you basically just insulted me and completely ignored the core of my argument. So... That, that's a really meaty and deep interaction. Key code recovered.
pilot was able to correct their approach and safely bring the plane down, managing to effectively land it sideways, fast and the furious Tokyo Drift style. I mean, the pilot handled the situation so well, I wouldn't be surprised if it was actually Vin Diesel in the cockpit. Plane Pursuit Now despite Storm Barra's perilous winds, this incredible pilot at Manchester Airport refused to abort their landing, proving that they could safely land the aircraft despite the dangerous weather conditions. This situation required the pilot to make rapid adjustments to their landing, and incredibly, the ace pilot was able to correct their approach and safely bring the plane down, managing to effectively land it sideways, fast and the furious Tokyo Drift style. I mean, the pilot handled the situation so well, I wouldn't be surprised if it was actually Vin Diesel in the cockpit. Plane Pursuit Back in August 2019, a cop with the Washington State Patrol was cruising around when he was suddenly forced into an unusual pursuit. Normally, car chases are confined to the ground, but this one started in the skies when a small propeller plane was forced to make an emergency landing in the middle of a busy road. The cop's dash cam picks up the moment that the plane shoots past him, flying dangerously close to the ground. The cop pulls a U-turn to pursue the pilot, but thankfully, they didn't need a SWAT team to knock the plane out of the sky, and the aircraft eventually touched down on its own. The pilot even respected traffic laws, stopping the plane at a red signal. It turns out the poor pilot's fuel system had malfunctioned mid-flight, and the plane was going to run out of gas before it reached a runway. As a result, when the cop hopped out of his car to approach, he didn't put the pilot in cuffs. Instead, he helped him push the plane off the road. Forget the long arm of the law. This is the strong arm of the law. Beach of a landing. Ah, uh, there's nothing quite like a relaxing trip to the beach. Sitting in the stand, getting a tan, dodging planes falling out of the sky. Wait, what? Now, this clip comes from the 2021 Cocoa Beach Air Show in Florida, when the pilot of a World War II era TBM Avenger was forced to perform an emergency landing in the ocean. While flying in the air show, the pilot started to experience mechanical issues, losing altitude as the engine of the TBM Avenger cut out. The plane started to enter a nosedive its sharp propellers heading straight for a beach of hundreds of spectators. Incredibly, the pilot managed to avoid a potential disaster, turning the aircraft and smoothly ditching it into the ocean to avoid the civilians below. There were a few people swimming in the water when the plane went down, but luckily nobody was hurt during the incident. Once the plane had splash landed, beachgoers waded into the water to help the pilot. While they later managed to salvage the wreckage, the plane was left in a near unrestorable state. But more importantly, the pilot wasn't harmed. He was even able to climb out of the cockpit, sit on the plane's wing, and wonder how he was going to explain this situation to his boss. Land in the sand. While landing in the sea might sound like a nightmare, landing on the sand is a much more terrifying prospect. Don't believe me? Well, take a look at these beach landings filmed in Orange County, California and Treasure Island, Florida. His engine stopped.
The footage comes from opposite coasts, however the situations are incredibly similar. Both beach days went from relaxing to terrifying, when the pilots' engines cut out mid-flight, forcing them to make emergency landings on the sand. Now, you might think that landing a plane on a soft surface like sand would be relatively safe. However, when it comes to landing on aircraft, a softer surface is actually more dangerous to land on. A plane's landing gear is designed to land on a hard runway at high speeds. When the wheels hit a sandy beach, they sink into the ground, and the plane's momentum can cause the landing gear to get wrenched backwards and break, forcing the plane to crash nose first. Luckily, in both cases, the planes were landed at the perfect angle to prevent wrenching, allowing both pilots to walk away totally uninjured. I guess you could call it a crash sanding. Homemade Horror if the thought of flying a regular plane terrifies you, you might not be keen to learn that kit planes exist. These are aircraft akin to flat pack furniture, which arrive containing all the parts and instructions to build your own aircraft at home. Back in 2009, Kyle Davis and Joe Surwike from Florida used a kit from Sky Ranger to build themselves a homemade plane in an attempt to fly from Winter Haven to Lakeland. And the trip was going smoothly, but halfway through the flight, the engine suddenly failed. Now, when my IKEA desk starts to shake, the worst case scenario is some spilt coffee, but for Kyle and Joe, this situation became life and death, as the duo were left gliding through the air without any power. They briefly managed to restart the engine, but it cut out soon after, and the aircraft continued to lose altitude. Joe suggested landing in a nearby field, but the ultra-lightweight Sky Ranger wasn't designed for a bumpy landing, so Kyle headed for the road instead, lining up the plane with the asphalt as the ground rushed towards them. Miraculously, Kyle landed the plane perfectly, bringing the aircraft down in the middle of Heavendale Boulevard. Now, I'm not a big fan of clapping when the pilot lands the plane, but in this case, I reckon Joe's applause is justified. Kyle's perfect piloting saved both of their lives. And Kyle didn't just land the plane on the road, though. He managed to pull it out of traffic, taxiing the plane straight into a parking lot. Can you imagine being that level-headed in a crisis? All I can say is, props to him.
first-time flyer. Flying a plane may look easy, but it takes a lot of work. Qualified pilots require hundreds, sometimes thousands of hours of flight practice, a clear head, and an awesome uniform. Okay, fine, so the uniform isn't compulsory, but becoming a pilot definitely requires a ton of training, right? Well, not necessarily. Back in May 2022, a man called Darren was one of two passengers on board a Cessna 208 caravan when he experienced a real nightmare at 30,000 feet. Suddenly, his pilot fell unconscious halfway through the flight. Darren tried everything to wake him up, but he was completely unresponsive, slumped over the controls as the plane fell into a nosedive. As the plane dived towards the ocean, Darren ran out of options, and the passenger was forced to skip flight school and jump straight to graduation, taking the pilot's seat to fly the plane. At this point, Darren had managed to contact air traffic control, explaining his situation. I've got a serious situation here about pilot uh, gone incoherent. I have no idea how to fly the airplane, but I'm in pain and 9100. Number 333, Lima Delta, Roger, what's your position? I have no idea. I see the coast of Florida in front of me, and I have no idea. The air traffic controller immediately sprung to action, talking Darren through the process of flying and landing a plane. First, he figured out the exact type of plane that Darren was flying in, before printing off an image of the plane's controls online, allowing him to give accurate advice. Darren was then given his first ever flight lesson, a crash course with one primary objective, not crashing. Three, Lima Delta, Roger, uh, try to hold the wings level and see if you can start uh, descending for me. Uh, push forward on the uh, controls and uh, descend at a very slow rate. Eventually, Darren came in for a landing. The ATC held their breath, and Darren brought the propeller plane down to the runway, setting the aircraft down smoothly and slowly in what turned out to be a textbook perfect landing. Whether it was beginner's luck, natural talent, or a real-life miracle, Darren landed the plane without incident, and ambulances rushed to the scene to help the unconscious pilot. As all of this happened, other pilots and air traffic controllers listened in on the line with bated breath. American 1845, you can make the left turn there, hold short of one zero left, it's going to be a couple minutes, uh, you just witnessed a couple passengers land that plane. Not a problem. Uh, go ahead and uh, continue. We'll hold short one zero left American 1845. Man, they did a great job. Did you say the passengers landed the airplane? That's correct. Oh my gosh. Yeah, no. No, great job. No flying experience. We got a controller that worked them down. That's a flight instructor. As, As air traffic control praised Darren's landing, the paramedics rushed the unconscious pilot to hospital, where he was diagnosed with a torn aorta, a medical condition with an incredibly high mortality rate. People suffering from a torn aorta need rapid medical treatment to survive. And incredibly, the pilot made it to the hospital in time to receive life-saving treatment as Darren's incredible composure and ace flying skills allowed him to make a full recovery. Tightrope Choppers The success of a plane's landing is highly dependent on the runway, as we've already seen how a sandy or windy runway can turn a normal landing into a dangerous one in a matter of seconds. 